Hello, Reworld Clinicians. This is Ali Nasse with another clinical video for you. In this one, I wanted to get back to the basics and demonstrate the basic ESX technique with endosync in an anterior tooth. Okay, I've done a bunch of videos in the past on the basic and advanced ESX protocols, and also a few with the endosync handpiece. But I figured I'd start this video by spending just a couple of minutes reviewing the theory of the basic ESX protocol and also the theory for the use of endosync before I demonstrate the synergy between these two devices in a basic anterior tooth in a clinical case. So I'll first start talking about the basic ESX protocol and then discuss the endosync handpiece. As you know, the basic protocol was designed to handle basic canals, which are, by my definition, canals where a size 15 hand file reaches the apex easily. If a size 15 hand file has a tough time reaching the apex, then you're dealing with an advanced canal. Okay, let's do a quick sidebar. I've shared with you this definition of basic and advanced and advanced square types of canals in other tutorials, and you can find the link to view those videos here. These are terminologies that have developed to help communication and are not found in any textbooks, but I believe that they're really necessary as they help us communicate better when we're talking about managing canals. Basic cases are your typical non-calcified anterior and premolar roots and the paddle and distal roots of some young molars. In these types of canals, I believe that you can uh, complete the endodontic therapy with a minimum of two rotary files. That's it. Now, why two files? Because one is uh, too few and uh, three is too many, right? I'm just kidding. So you really need a minimum of two files for the following reason. It's because you first have to reach the apex with a file before you can gauge it and determine what is the appropriate master file for that canal. In single file techniques, you then have to guess your master file from a radiograph, which is obviously inaccurate. And then when you guess wrong, it's really no longer a single file technique because you have to use additional files. So if you reach the apex easily with a 15 hand file, you can triage the case into the basic protocol. And in this protocol, you first work the expediter to the full working length. And when the expediter is at the apex, you choose which finishing file to use based on how difficult it was to get the expediter to that length. If the expediter experienced significant engagement to the apex, then you will choose a 25 master file. If it experienced moderate engagement, you choose a size 35 master file. And if it was minimal engagement on its way down, then you can choose a 45 master file. That's all, it's fairly straightforward. Of course, you now have all the in-between ESX file sizes as well, and you can choose either size 30 or 40 file for master file if that's what you prefer. Also, don't forget that you also have the end of sequence files that have the whole gamut all the way to a size 80. That the protocol is merely a guideline and the expediter to master file relationship is not written in stone. You should use a file that you deem appropriate for the canal that you're dealing with. Just keep the big picture in mind. Your goal is full debridement of the canal. And if you think that there's some leftover tissue on the walls, then by all means, move up to a larger size and a larger size master file if that's what's needed. Okay, that's for the ESX. Now let's talk about the endosync. As you know, this is a new addition to the endo sequence and ESX line and represents a cordless rotary handpiece that works great with a special rotary motion that I call safe rotation. Safe rotation is called OTR or optimized torque reduction by the manufacturer. And it's basically a 360 degree clockwise rotation with a sudden 90 degree counterclockwise motion when you exceed the program torque value that you set in the handpiece. And these torque values can be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, or 1.0 Newton centimeter. Now, I have been playing around with the different clinical torque settings on this handpiece over the past few months that I've been using it, and I've found that 0.6 newton centimeter at the present time seems to be a nice little uh, uh, medium for maximizing the safety and efficiency of the technique for OTR and the safe rotation using the ESX. To learn more about handpiece motion versus the operator motion, check out our video over here with this link. 
Anyway, the way I recommend using the handpiece is in three specific phases. In phase one, you're trying to get down to the apex after your axis preparation. And there I recommend a 300 RPM with a 0.6 setting on your OTR. During the phase two, you're measuring the working length. And here, uh, you should be connecting your uh, handpiece to the apex locator, which is the EndoSync AI that works with EndoSync. And in this phase, then I recommend using 300 RPM with the OTR setting of a 0.6 and then having apical stop, which means that whenever the file reaches the apex and the apex locator signals the handpiece that we have reached apex, the file stops. During the third and then the final shaping phase, which is after apex locator measurement, you will detach the apex locator cord and then go cordless like a regular handpiece again. And then you proceed to do the technique of uh, rhythm motion using OTR. And here I recommend that you move up on the RPM to 500 RPM uh, as, uh, as the speed for the end of sequence files. And an OTR setting again of 0.6 Newton centimeter, which will enhance your safety and efficiency. And you would then use the rhythm motion in this technique again. Basically, the EndoSync is a great tool, and for the light uh, cordless handpiece that it is, uh, which allows you to connect it to the apex locator when it's needed and measure the working length on the fly, it really is worth giving it a shot. After this long-winded talk, it's time to get into the video and demonstrate the technique and show you how this whole thing comes together in a basic anterior tooth. Okay, let's take a look at this maxillary right lateral incisor. As you can see, this tooth has a little bit of a resorptive lesion directly on the buccal middle aspect of the tooth. And upon testing, the tooth is testing with irreversible pulpitis. The patient is symptomatic in this case. And we're going to do root canal therapy in this tooth to address the patient's symptoms. The patient understands that the resorptive lesion, if it's perforating, may or may not require surgical intervention in the future as well but at the present time the symptoms are the main uh, problem there is no probing and everything is normal there is no percussion sensitivity there is increased thermal sensitivity that lingers so the diagnosis is irreversible pulpitis and it's a symptomatic case as usual we begin the process by using a radiograph to make an estimated working length and in this case we come up with about 22 millimeters as the estimated working length so we proceed our access preparation at the beginning we use our saber cut burr from the rebuild endo access kit align it with the proper inclination of the tooth and begin our access process lingually on the tooth with having very light touch because it's important not to put too much pressure in order to avoid potentially causing craze lines or cracks on virgin enamel in the anterior teeth. After the preparation for the access has been completed using the saber cut, I use the ultrasonic wood water pressure as uh, normally I always do following uh, any type of a use of a burr I follow it up with the ultrasonic and water to remove that dentinal mud that has been created this clears out the area from any debris and now we're ready for our first instrument to get inside the tooth and here we're going to use a hand file and the hand file which is a size 15 is going to help us triage the case to see if we're dealing with a, a basic or an advanced case of course we know this is going to be a basic case we put the expediter in the endosync handpiece and we connect it to the endosync ai and the setting would be at about 300 rpm with a otr setting of 0.6 so we're taking a few strokes here uh, using single stroke and clean and working our way down using the endo swipe, cleaning the debris after each stroke to engagement. We're trying to stay below the engagement of the OTR if possible. And then very quickly after a mere few strokes, we have reached the apex and the uh, EndoSync AI, when it's connected, it'll let us know that we have reached the apex and the file stops at the apex and at that point we can adjust the stopper now at a few millimeters short of the apex there is a little bit of a stop here or there's a little bit of a ledge if you will and that ledge is caused by the resorptive lesion 
and I normally prefer to repeat this process once or twice to make sure that we come to a stop at a specific point that indicates that we have reached the apex. And then we proceed to do a confirmation radiograph, which will let us know that we have actually reached the apex and the apex locator is correct. So apex locators are very accurate, but a confirmation radiograph is always very helpful. So you can basically use either the hand file for your confirmation x-ray, or you can even use the rotary file on your um, endosync, in this case the expediter, to uh, use for your confirmation x-ray. In the advanced case, it may be any of the scout files. Okay, so the expediter reached the apex fairly uh, easily with minimal engagement. Therefore, we're going to use a size 45 ESX as our master file. So, uh, expediter had reached the apex after a few strokes, so we're moving on to a 45. Once again, we can see that a few millimeters from the apex, there's a little bit of a ledge. So if we have the orientation of the file facing uh, the buckle, it'll engage that ledge. But what we need to do now is to just basically uh, orient the file tip a little bit more towards the lingual to stay away from that ledge. Once again, the ledge is uh, secondary to the resorptive lesion that's in the area. It wasn't caused by the instrumentation, just the, uh, the same resorptive lesion that was apparent on the x-ray. Now, as you saw, after a few strokes, we have reached the uh, working length using the 45 ESX finishing file. So our master file is a 45 and our master gutta percha cone is going to be a 45 as well. So at this point that we have achieved our shape so efficiently as you saw, uh, the process of irrigation will have to continue so that we can fully disinfect the space. Now, we're not going to, I'm going to skip the irrigation process, but this is a critical and a very important part. You make sure that since you have created your shape so efficiently, that you then allow yourself to do adequate irrigation. Also, it might be a good idea to let the canal soak a little bit with hypochlorite before getting to the obturation. Again, just because the instrumentation now is so efficient, spending a little bit of time with the disinfection in addition and running a large volume and adequate time would be a good idea. You can use additional ultrasonics and things like that to activate the irrigant, but at the present time, uh, we're just going to start our cone fitting here and we're taking a size 45 cone fit and take another radiograph and confirm that our cone is fitted to the end. And here you can see the cone is fitted completely to the length. And using your locking pliers, we lock the, uh, the fitted cone at the reference point and put that aside. Then it's time to dry the canal. I use a micro suction to dry the canal, but you can use uh, paper points or whatever you prefer. Uh, and then once the canal has been adequately dried, it doesn't have to be desiccated because you're having a hydrophilic sealer. As long as it's moist, that's fine. Then I'm injecting the sealer here. Now, this is the advanced protocol in which I'm injecting directly into the tooth. If you recall from previous tutorials, you don't want to inject directly into the tooth unless you have a microscope where you can see how much you're injecting. So you're not going to end up either overfilling or underfilling. Uh, in those cases, if you don't have a scope, you have to place the sealer traditionally using a file. Here I inject directly into the upper half of the canal, and then I use an additional file, a rotary file, it could be your master file or a couple of size smaller file, uh, and then push it down to the full working length. Just make sure that all the canal walls are coated adequately, and then what you can do is then you can seat your coated gutta percha cone that you have also coated in the sealer all the way down. By having this cone locked at the reference point, you can confirm that the cone is fully seated when it reaches the reference point. Now you can use the Endo Pro 270, which is a cordless heat source, uh, sear off at the level of the orifice while the assistant holds and pulls off the handle. And now you have a molten gut approach in the chamber. Try to give yourself a little bit of molten gut approach above the orifice, a millimeter or two. And then use the largest plugger, size 10 plugger, to condense this molten mass down into the orifice and making sure that you are covering the whole orifice with gutta percha so you're not seeing any sealer or sealer rim remaining around the orifice. 
you can dance methodically using light pressure using a size 10 condenser first and then move on to a smaller size number 9 condenser and even possibly number 8 if necessary. The goal is to walk the condenser around the margins. Once the gutta percha has been adequately condensed, it's time to remove the excess sealer and that will be done with the ultrasonic and water most efficiently and it will clean out all the remaining sealer on the canal walls. Just make sure that you're not touching the gutta percha with your ultrasonic tip and you're just touching the, the walls of the chamber. Now you have a very clean and uh, dry chamber and you can do one last round of condensation using your number 10 and number 9 plugger to just uh, push the gutta percha down and conform it completely to the walls of the RFS. Now we're going to proceed to fill the access opening here. I'm just going to place the endo sequence core material which will require, a, being a reinforced composite, requires bonding. So I'm using a dual cure bonding agent here. Remove the excess using a gentle stream of air to thin out the bonding agent. Then I proceed to cure the bonding agent. And once the bonding agent has been cured, now it's time for the core material to be placed. And we're using here the opacious white uh, endo sequence core material. You always extrude a little bit of the mixed material that comes out and then uh, almost in a bulk fill way fill the entire um, chamber with the endo sequence core material and proceed to light cure the whole thing. And here it is our final fill. As you can see here the uh, canal has been filled adequately and even the resorptive lesion has been filled with the sealer that has been expressed using hydraulic condensation and you have lateral pressures that are exerted by the cone filling this area. Now the patient was followed up about a month and a half following this treatment and there were no symptoms in this tooth and there was no probing and no buccal palpation or percussion. The tooth has been healing very well and I'm going to follow up this case in the future. At this point with the opacious white core material and the access preparation, I usually have the patient go back and see uh, his uh, restorative dentist and have the restorative dentist remove a couple of millimeter from the surface of the core material and place a nicely smooth and polishable um, aesthetic composite restoration in the access opening. As you saw, EndoSync and BASIC ESX protocol make for a powerful combination when it comes to dealing with your basic root canal anatomy. I will also show the same synergy when dealing with advanced cases in future tutorials. In the meantime, don't forget to visit us on our website, rewildendo.com, and take a look at the schedule of our courses and seminars. While there, take a look at our ultimate hands-on training program that we offer where you can have customized one-on-one -on -one training in the privacy of your own office. Lastly, join us on the social media and share this content with your colleagues and friends. Don't forget that sharing is caring. For Rewild Endo, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful.